Uh, good morning, everybody, and thanks for like spending your Saturday morning listening to me talk about the earthquakes and tsunamis. Uh, before I start, I just want to thank the committee for this invitation, and today I'll be discussing some of my PhD work at the University of Illinois. I'll be discussing mainly uh, modeling earthquake cycles with high-resolution fault zone physics, and if time permits, I will also be discussing how we utilize similar physics-based model to reassess hazards associated with tsunamis. Uh, I also want to acknowledge some people before I start who contributed significantly to this body of work. So Ahmed Al-Banna, who has been my advisor and mentor for the past seven years at University of Illinois. Shauma, who graduated, but he helped me immensely at the start of my PhD. And currently, Shumun Mia, who is uh, collaborating with me on a lot of the projects you'll see now. So natural hazards like earthquakes and tsunamis cause significant humanitarian impact and economical damage. I uh, have a particular thing in mind. So the year I was born in Egypt, it got hit by a devastating magnitude six earthquake that damaged a significant portion of the area my family used to live in. And while it would be nice to predict when the next earthquake will happen ahead of time, it's uh, as the US Geological Survey likes to put it, it's an impossible task that is not gonna happen in the foreseeable future. Uh, so the main reason for that mainly is that we lack the data. The problem uh, is the time span of an earthquake cycle is usually, is usually centuries and even more. And the earliest recorded data point in modern history is like 135 years ago. And they say only because that's the time scale we are dealing with here. Uh, so why embark on this task? Well, since we like the, since we like the data, the possible solution is to combine field observations and data sets, which are usually limited to surface observations with lab scale experiments that are usually small in scale, and perhaps develop a theoretical framework that we can combine with other computational methods that we are aware of, and hope that we can develop models with predictive power that can predict when the next earthquake or tsunami happen. And I kind of agree with the US Geological Survey. I think uh, we're still far away from that, but we can uh, still work toward understanding the physics that govern the occurrences of earthquakes and how we can add and how adding complexity uh, to our models affect the, the behavior of earthquakes and the source physics governing it. So how exactly do we do that? Much like any engineering problem, we start with a simple conceptual model that have some idealization. We define a bulk and a frictional surface. Uh, one can think of a very big uh, fracture problem and we define a set of governing equation with boundary conditions. And our objective is to study the long-term and the short-term evolution of this fault surface in the middle. And as we, as we keep going, we can add more complexity, such as uh, complex geometry of the fault, uh, add some damage, add some fluid infiltration. All of these complexity we can add later on. So it sounds simple, right? But actually, uh, the problem is multi-scale in both space as well as time. So as you can see in this figure, Usually fault networks span entire countries and they interact with one another. And additionally, the small scale, such as the gouge scale or the grain scale can also affect substantially the source physics of earthquakes, how the rupture propagate um, and the energy budget during the fracture process. In time, as we all know, the recurrence of earthquakes is usually years, but the span is just a second, right? And the truth is, as this beautiful illustration uh, shows, is uh, we're not modeling a spherical cow in vacuum. Reality is much more complicated than that. And adding this complexity usually adds computational cost. Uh, so to put things in perspective, here I'm plotting a typical seismic cycle, which consists of multiple events. Usually you have aftershocks, uh, foreshocks, or main shocks. And this cycle spans different time scales. Uh, model up until recently have focused mainly on uh, single earthquakes within the cycle. An alternative approach that has been gaining some traction is modeling the entire cycle, but this also suffers from the computational intensi uh, intensity required. And while the former is much more simple, we are aiming for the latter as, can, as it can provide more insight and predictive capability. An example of the spatial scales that we're dealing with, fault zones such as these shown in these figures, 
are usually surrounded with regions of extensive damage, narrow regions of extensive damage. And in order to model uh, these small scale, we have to discretize the domain very finely to capture this scale, as well as deal with the large scale associated with a fault embedded in kilometers uh, of bulk. So our idea is that we did in order to handle this computational cost is basically we focus on this local heterogeneity. And instead of modeling the actual problem, which is kilometers of scale with the really fine resolution near the fault surface, what we do is uh, instead of discretizing this fault volume, we just discretize a small portion that contains this heterogeneous behavior and use a boundary element approach with a known fundamental solution to capture the behavior of the rest of the domain. This reduced significantly the computational cost associated with the problem and allow us to actually use higher resolution within this region to capture the fine scale features. And similarly in time, uh, single earthquake models usually model few seconds. Here we're aiming to simulate years and years of slow loading and then dynamic ruptures. And in order to do that, we rely on a simplification that mainly ignores inertia during the periods without earthquakes and then reincorporate it back during the periods of earthquakes. This way, uh, we can have less stringent conditions on the time integration. So how do we represent this mathematically? We start with a set of governing equation, here the balance of linear momentum, and at the boundaries of the truncated domain, we enforce that the traction comes from the boundary element approach. While uh, here on that frictional surface, we enforce some set of boundary conditions such as jump and continuity. And the traction on the fault uh, surface is governed by a frictional law, which depends on the relative velocity, as well as a state variable that define the contact, lens the contact length between these two half spaces. And that evolves given a specific evolution law. Um, the discrete set of equation looks something like this, and this requires a nonlinear solver in order to handle the terms for the friction. Quasi-statically, this becomes slightly more simplified, but still require the same computational effort in order to identify uh, the tractions on the fault surface. So how does this look exactly uh, in terms of implementation? Here's an example of a rupture that nucleates at the center uh, of this figure. This rupture produces velocity waves that are gonna propagate within this media. And uh, typically a full model would have to discretize this whole domain as a large, a large domain as these waves would interact with the edges and maybe reflect back and impact the propagation. Even if you incorporate some sort of absorbing boundary conditions, they still will not be ideal and you will still get some reflected waves that would impact the propagation. So utilizing our framework, we can truncate this whole domain into this simple strip and only model this small part. As you can see, this, the both solutions within this regions are identical because while we don't model the rest of the domain, it's effectively there. So there is nothing being reflected back to the fault surface. And this reduces the number of degrees of freedom within our models and allows us to perhaps simulate something more complex. So in order to validate our approach, uh, we did some numerical studies to test this uh, coupled idea um, versus like fully discretized models. And we have demonstrated that both are similar in multiple publications. We also uh, looked at the computational time and found that we can speed up our simulations by 26 times, as well as reduce the memory cost associated with these models. So the main objective of my work is to incorporate this fault zone complexity that I was talking about earlier in earthquake cycle models and observe how they alter or perhaps don't alter uh, the sequence of earthquakes. There are two main types of complexity that we can introduce in our modeling. One is a pre-existing model. For example, we can uh, introduce material heterogeneity prior to simulated history and see how this affects the simulation. Or we can introduce small scale fractures next to a main fault and see also how this would impact. Alternatively, we can look at an evolving fault zone in which we uh, model the evolution of that fault zone along with the uh, rupture propagation as well. And due to complexity of either of these models, they have been mainly solved using single earthquake models. So first order of business is we investigate the role of material heterogeneity uh, on the evolution of the earthquake cycle. And to investigate that, we incorporate a region, uh, an interior region 
of varying material properties as shown in this figure here. And if you'd look at the simplified model, you'll see that we have a material one, which is usually softer, indicating a pre-existing damage prior to the simulated history. And indeed, in the work we published, we demonstrated that incorporating this region have substantial impact on the earthquake cycle. Here, for example, I'm demonstrating the impact of width of that material heterogeneity for three cases of increasing width. And on the right, I'm plotting the peak, uh, peak relative velocities during a 900 year period. And without going much into details, each of these individual peaks that you can see in these figures represent a seismic event. Uh, as they demonstrate the time history of the relative velocities at the interface. And we, uh, we basically demonstrated that the width of this region impacts significantly when the earthquake occurs, how big the earthquake is, and uh, the spacing between each uh, two, set of, two sets of earthquakes. Uh, in, that, in that same study, we also explored the role of the material contrast, et cetera. But for the sake of time, uh, I, I referenced the article here. Uh, please let me know. Also, you can let me know in the discussion if you have any questions. So our next study, we focused on modeling a fault zone with bimaterial interface. And here the fault surface bisects two half spaces with varying material properties. And the varying material properties here result in an interesting interaction in which stress is being transferred from uh, one of the mediums to the other. And this can alter the frictional behavior during the rupture propagation. And as this will be relevant to my subsequent uh, discussion, I just want to mention that usually in fault modeling, we have sections that are creeping. These are what loads the seismogenic zone. And we have a seismogenic zone in which the earthquake is confined to. So in this body of work, we uh, mainly demonstrated two things. The first is that introducing this material contrast, uh, as you can see in this figure, contributed to much larger relative velocities at that interface surface. And interestingly, uh, and interestingly, we also discovered that, uh, that the rupture extent can extend can, can go well beyond the seismogenic zone, which have significant implication on hazard analysis. Next, we looked at the role of an evolving fault zone. Here we use a simple model of uh, plasticity, a Drucker Prager plasticity, and we add viscous relaxation. Uh, the yield surface here has a component, which is the mean stress, and this is known to work for like uh, soils, etc. And what this does is that uh, it impacts basically the yield surface as uh, the rupture is propagating. Here in this figure, I'm showing a mode two fracture. And as the crack is moving, it creates these regions of dilatation and compressional fields. And since the yield surface depends on the mean stress, uh, these dilatational fields would be more preferable for plasticity accumulation. Of course, these, uh, this, this, this quadrant distribution depends, of course, on the direction of the crack, uh, where the crack is moving, et cetera. Uh, so in this recent work that is currently under review, we explored how earthquake cycles could produce different plasticity accumulation patterns than what uh, we observe in single earthquake models. And here I am focusing on the patterns of elastic strain within that uh, fault zone. Rather than the magnitude, I'm highlighting uh, here the, distrib the distribution where the accumulation is more significant. Uh, and we demonstrated that because uh, in single earthquake simulations, people neglect the role of quasi-static loading. Uh, if the bulk is weak enough, it can have more distributed pat patterns of plasticity within the fault zone. And this has significant implication on the earthquake cycle uh, that we discuss in this article. Uh, Additionally, we also found out that due to the partitioning between uh, off-fault deformations that are permanent and the relative displacement on the fault surface, this results in uh, significant seismic complexity. Uh, so here I'm showing you that as I reduce the bulk strength, I'm getting more complex earthquake patterns. And I'm going to explain this figure because sometimes uh, it is hard to uh, grasp. So on this vertical axis, I'm showing the simulation time steps. On this horizontal one, I'm showing the fault surface where the location on the spatial location on the fault surface. And e the color contour indicate the relative velocities. So each of these uh, lighter color indicate a seismic event. And you can see that basically as I go 
uh, as I reduce the yield strength of the off-fault bulk, the, pat the, the, the pattern of seismicity becomes more complex. And this is mainly because uh, a lot of the deformation is being accommodated on the bulk rather than on the fault surface. And we found a mirroring case in like models of crack propagation using phase, phase field uh, by Brachital. And they showed that indeed at higher R sub Y, which here uh, is a ratio between the nucleation, uh, the nucleation stress and the yield stress. So when this ratio is high, the yield stress is, uh, substantial, is significantly low. They saw that as the crack is propagating, accumulating plasticity can actually pin that crack uh, until subsequent loading cause it to jump further. And they demonstrated that this is a repeatable process in which the crack would get pinned, accumulate due to accumulation of plasticity, jump, get pinned again, accumulate more plasticity, et cetera. And when they looked at the partitioning of fractured energy, they found that for models that are elastoplastic, there is a step behavior uh, in the fracture energy distribution relative to elastic models in demonstrating this particular behavior and how the partitioning of energy between the bulk and the crack propagation impacts how it uh, behaves. And uh, current work in progress is uh, complex fault zones. So usually folds are not just standalone as I have been demonstrated in my models, rather they have interaction between one another. And in this particular investigation, we looked at uh, how stress interaction between two propagating ruptures can impact the earthquake cycle. We also found out some interesting pattern of plasticity accumulation, some of them are intuitive due to the uh, stress concentration one would expect at, a, at the fault ends. Some of them are less uh, intuitive where plasticity accumulates in the region uh, overlapping uh, with, with overlap between these two folds. These were previously unidentified before. So some key conclusions regarding this portion of work is that uh, our numerical methods provide, a manage, provide us with a, a manageable computa a computational tool that. Uh, that can tackle the multi-scale nature of this problem. And we also show that incorporating complexity would lead to significant implications on the source physics. Additionally, the long-term nature of the seismic cycle can capture the evolution of earthquakes better than, sing uh, better than uh, mo models with just single earthquakes. So another topic that I will touch upon quickly in the remaining time here, and I'm, uh, feel free, we can discuss uh, more on later is, how we managed to reevaluate the tsunami hazards through similar physics-based models of earthquakes and tsunamis. This was mainly motivated by an earthquake that occurred uh, in Palu, which caused a significant uh, tsunami. The emergence of this tsunami was particularly uh, confusing because strike-slip folds, which mainly uh, deforms in horizontal direction, doesn't provide sufficient vertical uplift to cause a tsunami wave on the sea level. So what we did is model uh, earthquake mechanics with a shallow water wave equation and try to understand how tsunami would evolve to, due to the ensuing earthquake. Here I'm showing a video of the seafloor velocity. You can see the wave is propagating due to the earthquake on the Earth's surface. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to show a quick video here of basically how the tsunami waves are generated due to that motion on the sea, uh, on the sea surface, on the sea floor, sorry. You can see that uh, even a strike slip fold that is primarily moving in the horizontal, can, uh, horizontal direction can provide substantial uh, tsunami waves. And this is a snapshot of the video, just demonstrating the same thing. And just for the sake of time, I will wrap up quickly here. So these physics-based model that I've been talking about can provide valuable insight on natural hazards. And this risk for particularly the tsunami part carries forward to other systems that people have previously ignored. And just a summary, uh, what I listed before is just a sample of the complexity that we can include in fault zones. We can have roughness. Um, we can have the de debris that are being uh, trapped within the interface surface, or we can have these small uh, interaction between the small branches and the main fault that can actually increase the rupture propagation speed. Fracture is one of the most challenging problem. Uh, a, reg a rigorous description of this phenomenon requires really modeling small scale. So earthquakes become even uh, a more complicated problem to tackle computation. That will be all. So thank you for listening and please let me know if you have any questions.